Oh, steady, steady. Better, sort of better, it's okay. Growing up. Growing up, my friends and I took the do not tr- What the fuck? Jesus Christ, get on with the video whistle. Growing up, my friends and I took the do not try this at home warning as something of a challenge rather than the safety advice that it was intended to be. That's Dave, not me. I was a, I, I would always take that very sensibly and never did anything dangerous as a child or as an adult. You guys want to see a video of me riding on the outside of my car just because, I mean, just f*** it, like... Also, real quick, we have a small problem. What is it? So, this, for everyone Check this out, just riding on the outside of a car. Did you guys see that? This was uh, on some like off-road path. <laughs> Dude, there's nothing quite like just standing on the outside of a car and just while it's going, just, woo! Definitely not. For about three years, uh, Dave writes it, I read it. That's the format of the show. Welcome, if you're new, subscribe, hit that like button, why not? <laughs> Why not smash that dislike button? For about three years, hardly a day went by where one of us wasn't jumping off a garage roof onto a trampoline, attempting various parkour stunts, or reenacting some insanely dangerous maneuver that we had watched on WWE Smackdown the night before. Trampolines changed. When I was a kid, trampolines were just like, I mean, my parents, they, they bought us a trampoline for the garden. And it was just, uh, it was like dangerous. It was this thing, it just had this big metal bar around the edge with like uh, elastic and then the thing you jump on. But it's like, if you hit that rock, you'd smash yourself on that metal really hard. And now trampolines are like, they've got a huge net, they've got all this padding and all of this stuff. And I'm like, and they're still really dangerous. Like, trampolines are dangerous. <laughs> Fascinating tangent, Simon. Thank you. Carry on. Just before we continue today, I want to give a big shout out to absolute legend of sponsor Squarespace. Look, if you're an entrepreneur looking to start out online, Squarespace, absolutely the place to go. They will set you up a beautiful looking website with no effort at all. Look, you uh, maybe you've got some idea you want to launch, but you feel overwhelmed by all of the options out there. It's a common thing. Don't worry about it. It's where Squarespace comes in. They'll transform your online journey. First up, there's the new Squarespace Blueprint AI and SEO tools. With this guided design system, you can create a personalized website that will fit your brand perfectly. Plus, integrated SEO tools mean that you're easily discoverable, helping people reach you faster, which is nice if you're running a business, isn't it? So now let's talk about flexible payments. Squarespace makes checkout seamless by accepting credit cards, PayPal, Apple Pay, and now you can even have buy now, pay later options like Afterpay and Clearpay in eligible countries. Game changer businesses looking to offer more payment flexibility, isn't it? And if you're into content creation, they've got courses. That's a feature that gives you the tools to create and sell your own online course. It's right there in the name, isn't it? Start with a professional layout, upload your videos, customize your course, set a price, bada bing, bada boom, you're good to go. So are you ready to take your online presence to the next level? Head to squarespace.com for a free trial. And when you're ready to launch, go to squarespace.com slash blaze. I'd use the code blaze to save 10% off your first purchase of a website or a domain. You won't regret it. And now back to today's video. In spite of one of these recreations involving me jumping from the roof of the local pavilion and landing on top of another guy who was himself lying on top of an ironing board, none of us ever sustained any injury more serious than a nosebleed or some bruising. Yeah, WWE's insane. <laughs> like, they're reenacting it. Jumping off a pavilion or some dude lying on an ironing board and it's like yeah i believe that happened I, I i've never seen wwe but i believe that could have happened this miraculous youthful immortality makes the fact that about six years ago i slipped on the stairs while running to answer the door to the pizza man and sustained permanent nerve damage in my back even more annoying oh, that's gonna hurt. yeah i was the other day just running up the stairs like there was the the, the delivery man and I'm like, don't leave, don't leave, I don't want to go to the post office. And I just slip and just slam onto the floor. And I'm like, ah, oh, ah, oh, oh. And I'm like dragging myself up and I go to the delivery van. Hi, thank you for the package, thank you. And then I just go back inside and I'm like, ah, oh, oh, why, why? And then it was some bullshit that I didn't even want. I didn't even know what it was. Stupid. Anyway, I digress. So do I, Dave. I guess the point I'm trying to make is that even youth will not protect you forever. Well, yeah, because youth isn't forever. And once you reach the age of about 25, everything seems to hurt much, much more. <laughs> I don't know, I felt like 25 still felt pretty good. 35, I'm like, oh, I see. 
I see. Things can go wrong now. I see. I see. Gotta be careful. Can't eat like a greedy f**k anymore and expect nothing to happen. Can't drink like a fish and expect to wake up with no hangover. Just do it brilliantly. Fuck. Getting old, eh? And I'm like, oh, what's 45 gonna be like? Sh Given this admittedly anecdotal information, I find it truly bizarre that there are people out there who make it their life's work to harm themselves for sake of entertainment. I mean, yes, but also they I'm sure they get paid really well. It's not like people are doing this but for free. In today's episode, we shall take a look at some of those people as we discover the most absurdly dangerous stunts that actually happened. Cliffhanger. This film came out in 1993. Wait, have I vaguely I vaguely remember this. Have I seen this movie? Ah, uh, how would I know? And although I vaguely remember watching it with my mum and dad, the only thing I can say with absolute certainty is that a mountain rescue guy completely fails to save a young lady, and she ends up plummeting to her death. Oh my god. <laughs> Climax of the movie. She just dies, and that's it. Da da da. Uh, it's supposed to be a cliffhanger to the next movie? <laughs> it was weird watching that new Mission Impossible movie, where they're like, oh yeah, it just kind of ends. And you're like, wait. Movies aren't supposed to have, like, to be continued. What the fuck? <laughs> it's great, though. Love Mission Impossible. Except for Mission Impossible 2, which was kind of garbage. But all of the other Mission Impossibles are excellent. Having now looked into the plot of the movie, wait, was it Mission Impossible 3, which is garbage? Which is the garbage one? One of them kind of sucks. And then they rebooted it as kind of like a semi-comedy thing, and it got even more brilliant. Having now looked into the plot of the movie in more detail, I found out that this scene is actually at the beginning, and the rest of the story involves Sylvester Stallone in some sort of heist situation. To successfully escape with the loot, the intrepid burglars must travel via zipline from one plane to another at 15,000 feet. Sounds realistic. A zipline between two planes. What if the planes just go slightly further apart? That zipline ain't gonna last. Nowadays, such ridiculousness would undoubtedly be performed through CGI. No, not necessarily. Not if it's a Tom Cruise movie. Tom Cruise is like, no, I want to do it for real. It's like, Tom, but we're uh, you, the movie's set in space. And he's like, yeah, 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 but I want to go to space, so we're going to film it in space. <laughs> Fucking hell. Or it's like, yeah, 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 no, I want to drive a motorbike up a up a cliff and then off a ramp where I do do a base jump onto a train, a moving train. And people are just like, okay, Tom, <laughs> sure, sure, Tom. But in 1993, there simply wasn't the available technology to make this look convincing enough for the big screen. Enter UK stunt coordinator Simon Crane. You know when you're at work and your boss says that Mark went above and beyond because he stayed for an extra 20 minutes to do some photocopies? Well, fuck Mark. This guy's where it's at when it comes to going above and beyond. Yeah, the pe where it's like, oh yeah, this employee went, this is just being a shitty boss. I don't think I've ever said this to anyone who works for me, where I point out extra work that someone else did for free. Because... It's just shitty. Because, I, I don't know, I never even thought of it as something I would do, but it's something that bosses definitely do. And they point it out to the other employees, expecting them also to do more shit for free. And it's like, bro, we are here to get paid. Do you not understand the relationship with the, 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 that's going on here? The reason the boss gets paid more is because he does more. The people below him don't have to do more for free. That, that, capitalism. I'm gonna vote for communists. This guy is where it's at when it comes to going above and beyond. Not only did he actually perform the stunt, but he also did so without any insurance because the company covering the movie refused point blank to sanction it. In spite of Crane's bravery, or insanity, you take your pick, I, it was still touch and go for a while as to whether or not the stunt would be included in the movie. Oh, can you imagine doing that? And then they're like, yeah, I don't know, we were gonna cut it, mate, just wasn't compelling enough, and it's like, for fuck's sake. Although he still gets paid, doesn't he? As it transpired, not only is traveling via zipline between two moving planes exceptionally dangerous, it is also illegal. Well, it is illegal in Europe anyway. To get the shot, the entire team had to travel to America just to film the scene. <laughs> I thought America had stricter aviation regulations than Europe. Now we know he managed to pull it off because he's included in this list. But did it go off without a hitch? Well, I'm glad that you asked. Didn't ask Dave. You asked and then you were answering the question. Dave, it's just a writing device. You didn't ask Dave. Stop! Well, the answer is no. <laughs> Apparently, it's quite windy when you're up at 15,000 feet on a zip line between two airplanes. And as a result of this turbulence, Crane smashed into both the door and the side of the airplane before dangling unconscious about six feet away from the engine. Ah, oh, that's gotta hurt. God damn, dude. <laughs> I was, for some reason, like, you know, you, your YouTube gets you some random recommendations. I watched a video this morning, which is like 30 seconds long, of just a motorcyclist getting cut up by a car. And he, the, motor, the motorcyclist crashes and the bike's like 20. He's got like a, a GoPro on his camera or whatever. Complete idiot driver pulls into this motorcyclist who's doing a fine overtake. 
And the motorcyclist's like, oh, for fuck's sake, I can't believe this. And he gets up and he starts walking towards the car that's also pulled over, of course. And then it's just, and then he's just like, he says something like, whoa. And then the video cuts out and it just says, this is where I passed out. <laughs> And it's like, yeah, body works for a little while of this. Like, whoa, you're just involved in a serious crash. You should be unconscious, my dude. Luckily, he was able to be rescued, and through some creative editing, the footage was still usable. Yeah, dude, like that uh, Tom Cruise movie. This again? It, maybe it's one of the Mission Impossibles, where he's like, he jumps. Uh, he's like doing a rooftop chase or whatever, and he jumps from one building to the other, but he misses his mark, and he breaks his ankle. And he's just like pushes himself up and starts chasing the dude with a broken ankle because he's like, whoa, if I'm in a cast, we're gonna have to wait weeks before we redo this shot. So he's just like, I've got to do it. <laughs> it's on Grease legend. I imagine the producers were fairly pleased about this because according to reports, the single stunt cost a million dollars to perform. Wait, in 1993? Holy shit. Crane didn't do too badly out of the movie either. In addition to his fee, Stallone lowered his take from the movie by a million dollars and gave it directly to Crane simply for being an absolute legend. He gave a million dollars to a dude. In, in 1993, that's gonna be like three, four million dollars today. That's crazy amount of money and you're just a stunt man you're probably making like not great money right stuntmen are not great paid are they i don't think so they, surely they can't be so stunt performers are hired through sag under a daily or a weekly contract a daily contract is 1082 dollars for eight hours of work a weekly contract is 4034 dollars for one week of work and if you work longer than eight or ten hours on each of those respectively, you get a little bit of overtime. Then you can also make stun adjustments depending on how gnarly or difficult or intense the stunt was. And he's just getting a fat old check from Stallone, from Sly. What a fucking legend as well. Lawrence Richard Walters. If you were ever in possession of helium balloon as a child, I'll wager that you probably wondered how many more you would need in order to achieve some sort of flight. Of course. Wait, is this the guy who straps the deck chair? to the helium balloons. We ya. Spoilers. Uh, just like goes on a journey. For most people, an idle wandering is about as far as it would get. Fortunately for both this script and my own personal happiness, Lawrence Larry Walters was not most people. This dude is like, he's a TikToker before TikTok was a thing. Because this is short, if you, this, people have done this on TikTok, right? They go on like, they must have done. Born in 1949 in Los Angeles, Walters harbored dreams of becoming a pilot in the US Air Force. Unfortunately, he did not meet the necessary visual acuity requirements and so instead, bizarrely, became a truck driver. Dreams of piloting his very own vehicle never left him though and in 1982 he hatched a cunning plan which would ultimately allow him to live his dream at least for a short while i've got a plan so cunning you could put a tail on it and call it a weasel after obtaining about 40 weather balloons under the guise of working for an advertising company he set to work building his aircraft well i call it an aircraft but perhaps because but perhaps because I love this story, I am being incredibly generous. What he actually did was tether his lawn chair to a jeep. What a twist. With a 30-foot rope, strap himself into said chair, along with some sandwiches, a bottle of beer, a pellet gun, and a CB radio, as well as several large cans of water, before filling his helium balloons and taking to the skies. I have a seed while I take to the sky. Okay, so the the water he pours out the water to gain height, and he shoots the balloons with the BB gun to to lose uh, elevation. Right? It's pretty clever. According to an article on the story, he thought he would ascend to about 30 feet and survey the scene. If it went well, the tethers would be severed, and he would float lazily out over Long Beach and further east toward the Mojave Desert. When he was ready to descend, he would shoot out the balloons one by one with a pellet gun. If he started descending too rapidly, he would arrest the sink rate by jettisoning some of the plastic watering cans by jettisoning some of the plastic water cans that he carried as ballast. Also, he thought, but when his friends set the device loose, the launch air did not float up as slowly as intended, but shot into the sky at a rate of 800 feet per minute. Fucking hell, did you not do any testing? Did you not do any research onto what lift these helium balloons are going to have by doing 800 feet a minute? 30 minutes, you're going to be at the height of a passenger plane. Unsurprisingly, this rapid ascent caused his tethering rope to break, and before he knew it, he was 10,000 feet in the air and still rising. And he's flying
Although he was terrified that should he open fire on the balloons, his makeshift aircraft would lose stability, as he approached 16,000 feet, way over the height at which it is recommended that you use a separate oxygen supply, he was left with very little choice in the matter. This has got to be fucking terrifying. And you'd just be like, oh god, I, this is a situation I've entirely got myself into. Unfortunately, after shooting a couple of the balloons and popping the gun in his lap to check his altimeter, oh, dude, no. A sudden gust of wind caused the weapon to fall, and he was well and truly screwed. My dude. What are you doing? You got a whole. Why is that gun not tied to something? Why haven't you tied that gun on with a rope, knowing that if you can't use the gun, you're fucked? Why? Why not just tie it on with a rope? Just a piece of fucking string would do. Uh, uh, yeah, I, I, I really don't yeah. know. To make matters worse, the wind had blown him into Los Angeles airspace, and this put him in even more trouble. Eventually, as the helium began to leak from the balloons, he gradually began to descend, finally ending up caught in some power lines from which he was immediately rescued and, just as quickly, arrested. <laughs> I mean, yeah, dude, of course, what are you up to? According to information from a different article, he was slapped with a $4,000 fine for various offenses, including operating a civil aircraft, of which there is no airworthiness certificate creating a collision danger to other aircraft and entering an airport traffic area without establishing and maintaining two-way communications with the control tower. On appeal, the fine was reduced to $1,500. Honestly, that's not bad. Even four grand's not bad for the amount of trouble that this guy could have caused. When asked by a reporter just exactly why he'd attempted this insanely dangerous stunt, Larry said, A guy has to do something. He can't just sit around in his backyard all day. Sadly, Larry did not receive a huge awesomeness based payment for his bravery. After enjoying his 15 minutes of fame, he quit his job to become a motivational speaker, realized he was not particularly motivational, and after struggling with depression for a few years, he took a hike out into his favorite spot in the forest and ended his life. See, that I don't like. Oh my god, Dave, why? Why did you just have ended it and be like, and he became a motivational speaker? I don't need to know the sad rest of his life, Dave, why? A tragic end for someone who carried out an awesome, death-defying stunt, not for financial reward, but simply for something to do. Jean-Francois Gravelet. This next individual is someone with whom I have a distant family connection. Stay humble. According to my dad, Jean-Francois Gravelet, more commonly known as Charles Blondin, is a distant relation on his mother's side of the family. But how did he secure himself a place on this list? Very simply, he was the first person to cross Niagara Falls on a tightrope. On the 30th of June, 1859, about 25,000 people gathered on both the US and Canadian sides of the river. Blondin tied a rope around an oak tree in America, secured the other end to a rock in Canada, and, a pro and at approximately 5 p.m., he set out on his journey with almost everybody believing that he would fail. According to one onlooker, with scarcely an exception, they all declared the inability of M. Blondin to perform the feat, the incapacity of the rope to sustain him, and that he deserved to be dashed to atoms for his desperate, fool desperate foolhardiness. A bit dashed to atoms. It's quite a good way of saying dead, isn't it? He's just going to get real beat up by an Agarra Falls, though. I, I mean, it would kill him for sure. Also, this dude he must be an accomplished tightrope walker. Surely he's done this, like, in a park, like three feet above the ground, before he's like, yeah, let's do it over Niagara Falls. Right? He's practiced it. He knows what he's doing. People were a lot more poetic back then. After making it about a third of the way across, he decided that this insane stunt wasn't quite dangerous enough, so he did possibly the most French thing anybody could ever do. No, don't do that. Sitting down on the rope, he cast a line down to a passing pleasure boat, hauled himself up a bottle of wine, and took a drink before continuing on his way. When he reached the halfway point, he stopped, a wave to the crowds, and then ran the rest of the way. According to somebody who met him on the other side, I wouldn't look at anything like that again. Not even for a million dollars. After a short break, he walked back to the other side. Apparently, the entire journey took about 23 minutes. According to an article from the Smithsonian, not everybody was as impressed as they should have been. The New York Times condemned such reckless and aimless exposure of life and the thoughtless people who enjoyed looking at a fellow creature in deadly peril. Oh, chill out, New York Times. We all love like We all it's like, it's like, why we watch dan like, dangerous shit? We watch it all the time because we're like, oh my god, this is so exciting. Because you, it's like you don't want the person to die, but it's also exciting. <laughs> While you might think that he would believe this to be enough to permanently cement his name in the history books, my great 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 uncle Blondin was not done with Niagara Falls. By the time he died, incidentally from diabetes and not from falling off a rope, it is estimated that he crossed the falls approximately 300 times in various ridiculous ways. Legends. These ways included but are not limited to doing multiple backflips and forward flips while occasionally dropping off the rope to hang beneath with one hand, pushing a wheelbarrow whilst blindfolded, wearing shackles whilst walking 
walking backwards, and most famously, whilst carrying a small stove, stopping halfway, cooking breakfast, and then lowering it to some passengers on board the same pleasure boat that had previously provided him with wine. Paying it forward. While I was vaguely aware of this story, because every time my dad has a glass of wine, he tells us about it, I had never bothered to look into it in any detail and just assumed that he had walked over in the traditional fashion. There's nothing quite like being upstaged by your ancestors. It makes my base jumping exploits in France look pretty lame. Wait, you've not been ba- Dave, have you really base jumped? That's fucking insane. If that's true, I don't know, it's like so insane that it can't be true, but it's also just written there so like matter-of-factly. Like I'm like, maybe Dave did do a base jump. <laughs> People do. <laughs> Nevertheless, it was definitely interesting to find out more about him with the added bonus that I got paid to do so. You're welcome, Dave. Kitty O'Neill. Fairly regularly, I receive complaints that these lists are incredibly sexist because they're primarily populated with men. Yeah, <laughs> as they should be, Dave. Am I right, Peter? Classic. While I understand the sentiment behind this point of view, there is actually a very good reason. Some of the most popular brain blaze videos of all time involve people doing really stupid things. Now, I'm not saying that women don't do stupid things. One of them even agreed to marry me. Ah, but a bum bum. But what I'm saying is that on balance, they do tend to be the more sensible gender, and therefore, there are just fewer instances of insane or dangerous behavior for us to work with. Yeah, this is undoubtedly true, and I don't think it's sexist. Men just do more dangerous sh because we're more stupid. I don't know what's wrong with us, but we just take more risks. We're just like up to shit. Like, we're just more childlike, even as adults. Like, my wife will be like, you're like a child sometimes. And I'll be like, yeah, no, I don't know. I don't know what's wrong with me. But it's like, so many dudes are like this. <laughs> Nevertheless, fewer doesn't equal none. So now let's talk about Kitty O'Neill. According to her Guardian obituary, uh oh. <laughs> we yeah. Spoilers. Kitty O'Neill was a trailblazer for a woman in the Hollywood stunt industry, after becoming the first woman to join the elite team at Stunts Unlimited. Among her many achievements, she was the stunt double for Linda Carter in Wonder Woman and Lindsay Wagner in The Bionic Woman. Obviously, throughout her entire career, she participated in far too many stunts to list here, but if I may, I'd like to focus on three record-setting ones. In 1979, while filming for an episode of Wonder Woman called Phantom of the Roller Coaster, she leaped unsupported from 12 stories. That's 127 feet landing on an airbag on a small pool deck. Fucking hell, that's so high. Although this earned her the world record for the furthest distance fallen on purpose, she would break that record a year later after falling 180 feet from a helicopter. If that wasn't crazy enough, she would also become the first woman to perform a cannon car roll. For those of you who don't know what that is, I... <laughs> certainly don't. Neither does Dave. He says I certainly didn't. This involves driving a vehicle rigged with explosives to make it flip over and catch fire. Back then, of course, fire suits were, shall we say, not quite as effective as they are now. Once she emerged from the planes herself ablaze, the safety team only had a few seconds to extinguish her before she received serious burns. So, if you held both of these records, what would you move to next? Well, if you're anything like O'Neill, you would seek to combine the dangers of falling from a great height with the dangers of being on fire. Makes perfect sense. In 1977, she did exactly that. That's right, she set a new record for the longest and furthest drop while on fire. For those of you who are interested, she fell 112 feet. Was interested, Dave? Thank you for telling me. It's kind of important. Outside of her movie career, she would also set world speed records on both land and water. Sadly, O'Neill would pass away at the age of 72 in 2018. I, wait, she was a stud woman who did all this crazy shit living to 72. It's kind of good. Like, I know it's not the oldest people can live to, but that, that ain't bad. But a legacy remains an inspiration to women everywhere that, with a little bit of effort, they can be just insane as their male counterparts. Jesus Christ. Get on with the video whistle.